The electric light bulb, invented by Thomas Edison or a black man. Let's try and settle that right now. You know, each year about this time during Black History Month, we run into the same debate about who's actually responsible for the key component that made the so-called practical incandescent light bulb possible. Well, it's February, so here we go again. Hi, I'm Elliot Francis. You know, Lewis Howard Latimer was a lot of things during his lifetime, but whether he can be credited as the man responsible for the invention of the light bulb, as some believe... It's a matter for historical record and timing. Born in Chelsea, Massachusetts in 1848, Louis Latimer becomes the youngest of four children born to former slaves George and Rebecca Latimer. After serving in the U.S. Navy during the Civil War, Latimer went to work as an office boy in a Boston-based patent law firm. It was here that Latimer began to acquire the skill that led to his work as a technical draftsman for Alexander Graham Bell. On Valentine's Day, 1876, Bell's patent for the telephone is being rushed to the U.S. Patent Office at the end of a frantic race to file before Bell's rival, Elijah Gray, files his patent for a telephone. In a last-minute panic, three days earlier, Bell assigns Latimer to create the application complete with drawings with only two days to spare. Latimer finishes the application on deadline, helping Bell secure his patent for the telephone. In 1880, inventor Hiram Maxim is Thomas Edison's chief competitor in the new field of electric lighting. He also hires Latimer, who is, among other things, working on a longer-lasting filament to make the light bulb more practical. The Maxim-Latimer collaboration results in a light bulb that lasts considerably longer than Edison's, but there's one problem. Edison already secured a patent for his light bulb back in January of that year, giving him legal bragging rights over the device. So, with all that in mind, who really made the practical incandescent light bulb possible? Thomas Edison or Louis Latimer? Joining our three gentlemen who I believe can lend some clarity to this debate, first up is Hugh Price. He was board vice chair of the Louis Latimer House Museum, located in Flushing, Queens, New York. He's former president and CEO of the National Urban League. He is also the great grandnephew. Louis Latimer. Don Wildman is the longtime host and narrator of Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum, as well as Cities of the Underworld, that's on the History Channel, he currently hosts the fast-rising podcast, American History Hit. And Steve Mitnick is the executive editor, Public Utilities Fortnightly. He is also the author of the book, Louis Latimer, The First Hidden Figure. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us all here on Now. Uh, Let's try and get right to the bottom of this uh, quickly. History, of course, records that Edison created the first commercially viable incandescent lamp, but only after months and possibly years trying to create a filament that would last long enough to be practical. Then along comes Louis Latimer. And as we learn more about him, we also learn that he, too, is also working on a filament that lasts longer than anything Edison worked on. Uh, Hugh, I'll start with you. All that said, where does Latimer's improved carbon filament uh, belong in history? Is it the component that gives him credit for this development? And if not, where does he land in history and why? I think Latimer made uh, two uh, game-changing inventions And the first you mentioned, which was to create or invent a carbon filament, which enabled bulbs to burn longer, be more practical and uh, efficient. And the other thing he did was uh, an invention which uh, facilitated the mass production of light bulbs so that they could move from industrial uses to use by everyday people, uh, ordinary people in our society. So those were uh, both uh, inventions that really advanced the ball quite dramatically. And... He hasn't gotten nearly the credit he should have. You know, I 
had occasion recently to read the very brief obituary of Latimer in the New York Times back in 1928. They gave him credit for um, uh, assisting Bell in developing the drawings <coughs> for the telephone, but they only said of his other work with light bulbs that he was an electrical engineer, and they did not mention that he's black. No, oh, really? Yes. Wow. So that's the that's that's where this this, this discussion starts. I <laughs> know absolutely, but you know, and amplifying the, the historical record. Sure, absolutely, and and I, I'm glad you mentioned that. And when we spoke before, you had mentioned that term, amplifying the the historical record. We talked back and forth, and I, it, it was my sense that there's some history that needs to be. Um, uh, amended here in the sense that there are many people who believe that Louis Latimer should be credited with uh, having invented the electric light bulb. Of course, we know that many people were working on it, but that key component that pushed it forward, that made it practical, he should get the credit rather than Edison. But you say that that's not well, possible. Edison got the first patent for a light bulb in the United States. All due credit to Edison for that. Uh, enormous uh, uh, contribution, historic contribution. But that bulb burned out very, very quickly and was not practical for use by everyday people. Latimer's contributions were to make the bulb more practical, uh, longer lasting, and also through his inventions to facilitate, facilitate mass production of the bulb so that they could be used by ordinary people in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the patent. And I'll put this out to every everyone. Um, how how important were patents in the sense of getting those legal and uh, and just general bragging rights back at this time before the turn of the twentieth century? Don, that's the that's the key oh. question for understanding all this. As important as patents are today in innovation and in commercialization, uh, they were uber important in the second half of the 19th century during a time of incredible innovation. And Louis Latimer was the Jedi Knight of, uh, <laughs> of Patton. He, but for Louis Latimer, Alexander Graham Bell wouldn't have been credited with the invention of the light bulb. Alexander Graham Bell, the the racist that he was, needed Latimer, hired Latimer, and Latimer got him just over the finish line, beating the competitor and getting his patent in first and, and accepted. Yeah. Let's, so, uh, yeah. You, no, no let, let's, let's stop and talk a little bit about that, because that's a piece of history that I don't think many people are aware of. It was, I believe, we're talking Hiram Maxim. Who, of course, um, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Elijah uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell. Alexander Graham Bell and and um, uh, Elijah McCoy. Am I getting? That's why I have experts. Oh here. yes, there was another. There was a, a competitor to Bell. Right, and he and yeah. the competitor was about to um, uh, file that patent on oh, on a Friday. Oh, absolutely, was there. How did that uh, happen yeah. through, throughout that oh. that two or three days? over Valentine's Day weekend. So there, uh, the word came out to, Bell's, uh, to Bell that he was going to be beaten. Mm -hmm. And uh, Latimer and Bell and Watson, as in Watson, you know, come here, uh, worked through the weekend. And Latimer was the one who put that together and got it into the patent office two hours before the competitor. Right. And that's why Bell is the inventor of the telephone. Absolutely. The, 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 the inventor, by the way, that we were stumbling over and trying to figure out, Elijah Gray, if, I, if I'm correct. Don is, Don, Don is smiling. So Don's like, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that really importantly, uh, I mean, there's so many episodes in this man's amazing genius life that all speak to a greater ability of his that I really admire. Uh, he was able to come into the process of 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 the creation of something and be able to see it for the forest see the forest for the trees i think that came at the beginning of his well there's many reasons personally why but uh in his in his abilities he was a draftsman he was a, a incredibly 
you know, natural born draftsman, great drawer. Uh, he could look at something as one does in order to render it. And when you see these patent drawings of his, they are brilliant and beautiful. And that speaks to his ability to see the, you know, the whole th 360 of the thing. Um, those people who are in the business of, in of inventing would have seen that right away because that's an incredibly rare gift to have. That's his in into this world, uh, the ability to, to render something generally and then to rethink it and find an, a new version of it. And he starts to do that with the, with the light bulb, certainly, but he does it in many different regards as well. And, and when you say render, I mean, it's not just a matter of creating the drawings, but there's a legal aspect to it as well that he had yeah. to learn in terms of uh, how to describe the, the invention and, uh, and, and yeah. make it clear to the patent office. Uh, the interesting aspect of uh, patent really exists in order for you to be able to, to defend your invention. And uh, if you can defend it better than someone else, uh, you'll get that patent. I mean, that's a speaking very generally, of course, but it's a really it's a, it's its own world, uh, the patent world. And it is, as Steve says, very, very important and kind of uh, evolving in the 19th century because of so much new technology. Uh, but those who you could know, prove you know, it would get the invention. The Lemelson Center at the Smithsonian considers Latimer's uh, technical drawings works of art, actual works of art. Hmm. No kidding. And so Latimer was, and he was, he was the megastar, the top free agent, if you will, in this art, which was fairly new, the art of patents. Was relatively new in the law and the art of this. He was so, so uh, respected that when Edison slammed Latimer in uh, a battle over patents on the light bulb, and, and only days after Edison beat Latimer at the courts, probably outmanning him in lawyers 10 to 1, <laughs> And Edison turns around and hires Latimer and puts Latimer in charge of his patents. Right, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, La Edison was the Eli Musk of his day. So, you know, he was the wizard. Mm -hmm. So for him to recognize uh, and want the, 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 the highest paid, uh, the best, the best uh, free agent, is indicative. <laughs> Steve, didn't, didn't Latimer supervise a crew of some 40 folks for Maxim's company making light bulbs. That's, that's he right. put a black that's man right. in charge of 40 white men to make anything. And that was unprecedented. The race, that was a huge job. But to be an African-American in charge of that crew was amazing. And he yeah. also, Maxim, yeah. sent him to London to run a light bulb manufacturing plant to service that market. Sent a black man to London. Incredible. In of the uh, British Empire. <laughs> yeah. As, so, as someone who he was, he was suffers, a real, trail, he was a real trailblazer. As someone who uh, suffers from a deadly imposter syndrome, I cannot believe how well this man coursed his way through industry, uh, absolutely uh, in command of his faculties. I mean, obviously, he was uh, very confident and uh, extremely gifted. Uh, but it's an extraordinary story from that aspect, just the psychological aspect of this man being able to to walk these halls with this in this world. I mean, he he wasn't formally trained. He trained himself. He bought his own tools to learn how to draft. Uh, he was just gifted. <laughs> he was out, outstandingly gifted. Yeah, yeah. And and he didn't even get past, he didn't even get past grade school in school. Yeah. Did you all know that? Yeah. I, I knew that his, his, his education wasn't entirely complete. I didn't know at what point. That, that's how incomplete it, that's how, in, uh, how unentirely complete it was. So, <laughs> he didn't yeah. get past grade school. So all that said, uh, Hugh, and, and you have, a, I think, a deeper understanding because of your familiar ties and your work with the Lewis Latimer House uh, Museum. What, what do you think, um, what do you, why do you think he was able to pick up these skills without formal training and move forward? Was he just wired that way? Or was there something else at work? preternaturally savvy. I think he was a visionary. 
Um, the Smithsonian has also called him a true Renaissance man. And when the Smithsonian says that of you, it means it's true. The other thing that I think has not really been explored is that when he was 16 years old, he volunteered for the Navy and he served uh, in the Civil War on a ship called the Amistad. Latimer at that very young age was exposed to very sophisticated machinery and he was exposed to hierarchical white dominated organizations, namely the military. Mm. And I think he acquired, nobody's written about this, but I think he acquired a lot of understanding of those two things, machinery, how to make it run better, and organizational structures, hierarchical organizations that stood him in good stead the rest of his life. Mm, absolutely. And I would add two other things is he, he believed in learning. And not only did he self-teach himself to be the best patent draftsman, then he taught himself to be the best uh, master of patent law. And then he taught himself to be uh, uh, one of the top uh, electrical engineers and inventors of his time. He did that all self-teaching. And then I would add one more thing is uh, he had to overcome just his parents were runaway slaves. Uh, he did some of this work literally with recent memory of the Civil War. And, um, and, he had to, and he was constantly in situations where it was uh, dominated by white men. And, uh, and they liked him generally. They respected him generally. Uh, for example, he became the head of a Civil War veterans group from his experience in the Navy. Mm -hmm. So in time and time again, when he walked into 65 Fifth Avenue, Edison's headquarters <coughs> in Manhattan, he was undoubtedly the only black man in that organization. And he, he writes about sometimes <coughs> that uh, visitors would come and they would wonder why he was there. But uh, I think he also had that ability. People liked him and respected him for his intellect and his character. And I'm glad you raised um, um, the, uh, the, the, the history, the lineage of, of his parents. His father, George, his mother, Rebecca, um, uh, ran away uh, uh, from slavery uh, some years prior. His father, you write, was uh, at one point more famous than, than he had, had become, more well-known, I guess, in the area because of his, um, uh, I guess you could call it, well, Adventures is probably too trite, but his ordeal in, uh, in running away and becoming a free man. Tell me about that. Uh, that itself is an inc They were runaway slaves. They were runaway slaves, but he was the first, Latimer's father, was the first famous runaway slave. Uh, and it was so famous or infamous because he ran away eventually uh, through Connecticut to, the Bo to Boston and... Uh, by accident, met up with uh, his master's uh, lead man, who recognized this runaway slave and tried to bring him back to Virginia. And it, it became a renowned court case whether, uh, whether he could confiscate George Latimer and bring him back to slavery in Virginia. And the whole nation was in, in, engaged in, in this uh, saga. And um, the, cr uh, the crime that uh, George Latimer was accused for was famously um, uh, theft, because the claim was that George Latimer, being property, had stolen himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he was jailed for the crime of stealing himself. Eventually, uh, there was a, a financial settlement to buy off the slave master, and Latimer's father was was freed. Mm. But that was me, uh, he was the first. Me. Please go ahead, Hugh. Let me let me just add a little bit to that. Uh, sure, George please. and Rebecca were my great great grandparents. Yes. Um, George was a very fair skinned man who could pass for white, and then Rebecca was very brown skinned. So everybody you know, recognizes this great book that came out last year called Master, Slave, Husband, Wife. 
Well, when they got on the ship in Norfolk, they stowed away below deck. But once they got to Baltimore on that boat, they came above deck. And George uh, presented himself as the slave master and Rebecca as his slave. And they traveled as master and slave from Baltimore to Philadelphia, Hmm. then as husband and wife the rest of the way to Baltimore. His case was so famous that it became the first national abolitionist cause that Frederick Douglass took on. Uh, in conjunction also with John Greenleaf Whittier. And so it was a huge, huge case. And after Lat- George Latimer was freed, he became uh, very involved in anti-slavery rallies with Frederick Douglass. And there was a big petition, uh, which was called the Latimer Law, to get passed a law in Massachusetts to prevent public officials from providing aid and comfort to those who were trying to recapture slaves. So he was a, he was a quite historic figure in this country. And then um, he didn't stay on that that uh, road very long, and then he, he went back to his regular life. And then he actually, in 1858, he left the family for reasons that no one understands. Uh, so it's kind of a sad ending. But uh, George Latimer was, was a major, major figure in the early days of abolitionists and fugitive slaves in the United States. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's go well, back to, uh, oh, go, go ahead, please. Please, Don. Uh, Hugh, does not the uh, the Dred Scott case play a role in that, though? I mean, that, that's... It might. We don't, seven, right? No one knows. No one knows. It is entirely possible that because the Dred Scott case made it lawful to try to recapture slaves and take them back south that he fled. But we don't know. And what's significant, two things. First is his granddaughter, Winifred Norman, says that he disappeared without a trace and she offered no explanation for why he left. She would know if anyone knew. The second thing I'd I'd add, which is difficult for me, is that Lincoln freed the slaves about four or five years after George Latimer left the family. He never reunited with them. Hmm. Okay. He he ended up remarrying. So we don't know whether there were some other issues and tensions in the relationship. But anyway, uh, he may well have been afraid of being apprehended and having his family uh, ensnared with him in that problem. Hey, Don, let, let, let's not, Don, Hugh, and, and Steve, let's not uh, assume that the viewer always knows what we're talking about here. Um, if you will, Don, elaborate on, on Dred Scott and, and why you asked that question. Just uh, Well, Dred Scott, you know, in my work on uh, American History Hit, when I podcast about this stuff, I'm always looking for some sort of touchstones. I mean, these are iconic uh, historical events. In this case, it's the Dred Scott case. I believe it's 1857. Uh, this is under... This Hello? is under uh, Judge Tanny. Oh, hold on. That's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Don. Okay. Uh, uh, it was the decision. Uh, it, Dred Scott was a, an individual who was living uh, as a in, in free Minnesota at the time with his wife. Uh, he had been enslaved prior, I believe, in Missouri, and um, because he'd been in Minnesota, Minnesota for for several years, uh, he assumed and and claimed that he was now able to be a free man and. And so he argued with the with the idea that he should have to go back to his enslavement. Uh, this was the case that was brought forth eventually to the Supreme Court, and they decided no that he he was not uh, he would not be free after this time period. And so it, it really it, at, at the heart of the matter was that the uh, there was uh, an, uh, it was declared that uh, people of African American descent were inferior to those of of uh, European descent in America. It was really the fundamental. A case that really triggered the Civil War for many people. Mm-hmm. Let, let's go back uh, for a second, go back to where we began this conversation and uh, yeah. the notion that Latimer is not getting credit that he is due for the creation of the electric lamp. Someone had mentioned, I think you, Steve, had mentioned um, uh, comparing Edison to uh, Elon Musk, certainly a, a fair comparison for the most part. But there are a lot of people that believe that Edison uh, was one of the first to use um, uh, intellectual property and, and in fact stole much of that property from people who created uh, advancements that he may have worked on, but that were really created by other people. And, and Latimer, when we talk about that, Latimer is considered to be one of those. I understand the importance of a patent. I get my patent in first, I can take credit for it. But it seems to me that if I have the the component that really pushes this advancement forward and I have it 
but I don't patent it, I'm still responsible for making this practical, commercially viable, and therefore should be given the credit for it. And but, but Lewis Latimer was working for a different inventor at that time. He was working for Hiram Maxim, not for Edison. So mm -hmm. if anybody protected anything created by anyone in his employee, it was Hiram Maxim. Uh, Hiram Maxim would take credit for the inventions of the, you know, that worked for him. So I don't know that the argument that Edison took it, stole it from uh, Latimer is, is correct. But I think it's also fair to say that the invention process is a very fluid process. There's a point in time when someone gets a patent for something, but that doesn't stop anyone else from working to try to perfect it. So that process was going on before Edison got the patent. It went on after because his, his bulb was burned out very quickly. So everybody's trying to figure out how to make uh, bulbs that burn uh, longer and how to mass produce them. And Maxim and Edison and, and uh, Latimer certainly in that game as well. Um, so I just, I just think we, we want to be careful of going overboard on that proposition. And that's why we use the phrase, let's just amplify the record and give due credit where the record justifies it. And it's also important yeah. to know that you know, Maxim uh, took credit for the inventions of people who worked for him. And so undoubtedly there were things that, uh, that uh, Latimer invented on his watch with Maxim that Maxim said, thank you very much, and I will file this patent. But fortunately, Latimer got some of his own patents in his name and co-patents with other people uh, into the patent office as well. And those are very significant, game-changing contributions, huge contributions. So it's important to give him credit for that which the record justifies and not speculate about what might or might not have been taken by somebody else. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that's my and, view. And I, so, I just think yeah. his his, his record is so large that we ought to just work off of his established record. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Thomas Edison deserves so much credit, but for he was a master, like uh, uh, Elon Musk of today, he was a master seller, commercializer, communicator, business person, and, uh, and he, was, he was ever present. He was a force of nature. And so uh, it, the, he was the wizard. He had, he had invented the phonograph. He had perfected the telephone. So it was so vital. He was, he was Elon Musk of the day. And so in this competition for the light, he got his patent in. That November 9th patent, November 9th, 19, 1879, he rushed it in. Um, at the same time, others like Swan, they're working, in, that was the patent that Westinghouse eventually used, and Latimer working for uh, Maxim. And Maxim was uh, distracted. Maxim really wanted to spend time with uh, maybe his uh, love in, in London and, uh, and really spend time there. So maybe that slowed down. Latimer's patent came in only four months later. Boom, 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 boom. These things happened. So, but Edison's patent got approved by the patent office in two and a half months. Yeah, how'd that happen? Latimer's patent got approved in 11 months, okay? Then Latimer turns around and files another patent, which arguably is the key patent, which is how to manufacture the filaments. Because Edison knew it was too expensive to make the light bulbs. He didn't have a way of mass producing it. Latimer, Three weeks later, files another patent on manufacturing the filament. Edison just absconded with it and just used that. And that's how we got uh, affordable electric light. So these things hmm. happen literally month after month. And, but uh, I think we should give uh, Edison his due that he created the R&D lab. He created the commercialization yeah. of innovation. And, and, and he swallowed up everything in his path, including George Westinghouse <laughs> and including Louis Latimer. <laughs> is, is there you know, Go on, you. one of the, another aspect of Latimer we haven't talked about. Uh, he wrote the definitive book about incandescent lighting. This kid right. never got past grade school. He wrote a book called Incandescent Lighting. I forget what the rest of the title is, but that was the Bible of incandescent lighting back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was, he was in everywhere. <laughs> And he was advancing knowledge and innovation 
all over the place. It's just an astonishing uh, man. Is, is there is there enough is there enough evidence is there enough evidence here in history to give co-creator credit to both men? No. Uh, no. Don't don't go there. There's okay. no point in going there. You're just going to get the whole Edison lobby all riled up. I don't and, care. Uh, there, <laughs> come on, no, come on with it. No, no, no. There's I know. No I'm just kidding. That because yeah. that just that discredits Latimer's legacy. The sure. Key for me is it's to make sure like, that uh, Latimer's legacy is clear. It's Go. almost like I think uh, Don might appreciate this. It's almost like arguing Hamilton versus Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they they disliked each other intensely. Okay. The, the formation of two parties, the, the two-party system in America is because of Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, something that George Washington was opposed, but he had both in his cabinet. They constantly battled. Uh, but to say, who, you know, who invented, you know, our, our federal system, who, in, who, who, who made, who, who caused us to have a federal government that was financially sustainable? Who, who, who got to the system where the Supreme Court was the Supreme Court under Marshall, all those things, who was more important? They were both. And they were both fascinating and tremendous individuals. Yeah. I, I, and this, this, this reminds me of a similar, similar fight between Farnsworth and uh, um, um, mm -hmm. uh, Sarnoff. Uh, and, right. and we go back and forth with these people and what they contributed and what they should be credited with. It, it, let me let me just push this one step further. And you mentioned, I, I love this phrase, Hugh, that we should be amplifying Latimer's uh, legacy and his uh, um, and, and his work. Have we amplified it enough at this oh, point? No, 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 not even not even close. Um, you know, in, in, in recent years, there have been major authoritative biographies of Edison and uh, Alexander Graham Bell with no mention whatsoever of Lewis Latimer. Mm. Major documentary on PBS, uh, no mention of Lewis Latimer. So we've got a long, long way to go. We're making headway. Um, there have been major mentions of him in series like uh, Blackish and uh, The Gilded Age, and Cartoon Network. Um, Steph Curry has dedicated his uh, Black History Month legacy sneakers to Lewis Latimer. So uh, there's a there's a steady growth in the recognition. We've got a long way to go, um, but we've come a long way. Uh, we car we partnered with Scholastic on the creation of a book for school children about Latimer. So it's it's coming, but it's 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 work. And you know we're working with a biographer to do you know somebody who was affiliated with David Blight to try to do one of their kinds of takes on on his life. Um, so we just got to keep working on it, and uh, and 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 it'll 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 come. It'll yeah. come. Yeah. And, and and we'll we'll continue, we'll continue to try and do it here too. Also in in our yeah. little way here at now. I let's talk about that. Said good segue for the work that you do with the um, the Lewis Latimer House Museum. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the the, the museum is uh, was once the family home of the Latimers in uh, Queens. In Flushing, Queens, uh, in the late 80s, it faced demolition uh, because it had become very deteriorated. And so Winifred Norman, uh, his, uh, Winifred Latimer Norman, his uh, granddaughter, spearheaded the effort to move the house to a different site and to recreate it as the Latimer Museum. Um, they got that done, but they struggled. The, the museum struggled for a number of uh, years. Uh, could barely keep the doors open. Board members served as uh, volunteer docents, and it was quite a struggle. But a remarkable thing happened, and it's a wonderful story. The museum is now in the heart of a heavily Chinese and Chinese-American neighborhood in Flushing, and a highly diverse neighborhood. In 2017, the board hired a CEO by the name of Ran Yan, who was born and raised in Beijing. She has done a fantastic job of spearheading the revival of uh, the, the museum. Uh, everything is up, budgets, visitations, uh, STEAM education programs. It's, it's magnificent. And we're on the brink of the next great surge in the museum because um, 
the interior was kind of fatigued. It was sort of what you think of as a traditional museum, uh, uh, historic house. But they didn't even have a lot of furniture from the original Latimer home. So it was kind of a makeshift thing and it was getting kind of tired. We decided we wanted to create a 21st century museum that is robust, that is dynamic, that is highly interactive. All we had in the way of video, uh, you know, a video was one video display terminal inside there. There are now going to be all sorts of interactive experiences that young people can have. The color is going to be different. The layout is totally different. And so we just figured we've got all these young people, young adults, people of all generations coming in. And we don't want them to just stand and look at displays. We want them to interact and dive deeply through technology into his life and the wonder of his life so that there are many takeaways from their experience by visiting the museum. Um, it's going to reopen in uh, May, early June. It's very exciting. It's not going to be your grandfather's historic house museum <laughs> by imagination, but kids are going to love it. And our view as a board is that this kind of museum is in the spirit of Lewis Latimer, who was always inventing, always creating, always looking ahead, and always engaging. And that's what we wanted this museum to do. We didn't want it to be a staid experience. We wanted it to be a dynamic, highly interactive experience filled with opportunities for discovery. Mm -hmm. Steve, your, Steve, your book, uh, Lewis Latimer, The uh, First Hidden Figure, continues to yeah. amplify, and I, I say I love that term. <laughs> and that, there it is continues to amplify this history where can we find it oh uh it's uh it's free so uh we it was sponsored uh by by our uh, uh by uh, supporters of our company uh it's at our website you can get it there fortnightly.com uh you could go it you could down read it in uh pdf uh you can click on it and um and there you have it. I and think that's, that's the idea, is to spread the good word. Absolutely. I think that's a wonderful thing. You can get it for free, or you can contribute. You can find that on Amazon as well. Um, Don, uh, tell me about the podcast. This is uh, relatively new for you as well, uh, uh, American History yep. Hit. Twice weekly, Mondays and Thursdays, new episodes drop. You can get it uh, by subscribing or not. You know, get it wherever you get your podcasts. American History Hit. I'm the host. I interview all kinds of people. I was honored to have Hugh uh, on doing a Lewis Latimer episode. In fact, you can go there and listen to that episode. Uh, last year we did that. And that was my introduction really into the story of Lewis Latimer. I went to that museum, uh, Hugh, and I... I was really charmed by it, but uh, I'm agreeing that it's it's exciting that it's going to be a new new look to the place. Um, I, you know, I just think that the Lewis Latimer story is the best of America. You know, just as so many African American stories are of of the courage to rise above a great disadvantage. But you can actually put that aside for a moment and just talk about the brilliance of the man himself and the genius of it and the exciting innovations he was involved in. Uh, and then you put it together and you get the holistic aspect of this man. And that's what's extraordinary about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it he's one of these rare American stories that transcends so much. So uh, it's, a, it's an honor to talk about him and even to think about him, quite honestly. <laughs> absolutely. And especially this time of year when we, when we try to do it as sure. much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Don Wildman, Hugh Price, Steve Mitnick. It's always, always a pleasure. Uh, thank you all for your time, knowledge, and the uh, privilege of joining us here on now. Thank you. Thank Ellie. you. And thank you for joining us. Remember, tell your friends, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and come back next week for another edition of Now. Till then, take care. Peace. <laughs>